thereafter. Cool. So welcome everyone to our uh, Q&A with uh, Preservation New Jersey. And tonight's feature is Historic Preservation Commissions. Um, I uh, love Historic Preservation Commissions and getting into this topic. And hopefully um, as PNJ you know, continues um, developing its programs, we'll do more HPC uh, focused panel, panel sessions. Um, I'm very familiar with the work of many HPCs, including my own. So I'm the chair of the Patterson Preservation Commission. Mm -hmm. I've been involved with the commission for the last 10 years. I've also been working with for the last year and a half with the Verona uh, HBC, who is just starting out. So uh, different dynamics. Patterson has been around for the last 30 years, but I won't talk too much about Patterson tonight because I'll leave that to our executive director. Um, so I'm just really excited um, to partner with, you know, Maria and Amos, who will share uh, the great work that they're doing in their cities. So I'm going to actually turn it over. We'll start with a round of introductions. Um, all three of our panelists have extensive experience in preservation and their communities. Um, so I cannot give their own introductions any justice. So <laughs> I'll start with uh, Maria, if you don't mind. Sure, thanks Kelly. Um, my name is Maria Boyce. I'm the chair of the Historic Preservation Commission in Westfield. Um, I've been involved in the commission for, uh, for the past five or six years and been chair for about four years. Uh, this is going to my fifth. And um, I too, Alma, live in a, a late 1800s home, uh, Victorian. It's always a labor of love. And I'm also uh, just right now sitting in a historically designated uh, cottage in Ocean Grove, where the uh -huh. entire town is um, uh, is locally designated. And, um, you know, I've always loved, grew up in New England, loved historic uh, homes. And before I really realized what it was about the homes that I love, uh, my um, brother ended up being an architect and, uh, you know, was able to really uh, school me a little bit more in terms of the styles and the types of homes that are out there. And uh, we've been doing some great things with the historic preservation ordinance in Westfield, but I'll leave that as we continue on. Um, I think that's all I need to say about myself right now. Thank you, Maria. Alma? Thanks. Yes, I'm Alma Saravia. By profession, I'm a longtime attorney. We won't say how long, but uh -huh. by my soul, I'm I'm a historic preservationist. I, I moved to Burlington, the, uh, the capital of West New Jersey, founded in 1677 before Philadelphia, when I bought a home from the city for $25,000. And anyone who's involved with historic preservation knows that's a steal when you spend unlimited money to restore a three-story, what might be called a city townhouse or city mansion, the Rob House. In any event, the mayor appointed me to the Historic Commission five years ago in 2019. I served at all the terms to date, and I'm a Class B member. We have seven members, two alternates, and what does that mean? I'm somebody knowledgeable about local history of which I will give a plug. We have a great deal. Not many cities have a book of this magnitude on the history of Burlington. It was a 30-year project for a historian, Robert Thompson, who wrote Burlington biographies. We were such a place that's important to the history of this country. And maybe the challenge for all of us in preservation is time changes. People come and they don't know the history of our buildings. Thank you, Alma, that was great. And John Franco. Kelly, hi Alma. Hi Maria. Hi everyone. I'm John Franco Orcamidi. I'm the executive director of the City of Patterson Historic Preservation Commission. I'm also the designated preservation officer for the city. Mm -hmm. And I'm also the director of the Division of Historic Preservation, which is in the Department of Economic Development. I have a master's degree in industrial archaeology. And some of you might know that Patterson is America's first planned industrial city. So coming to Patterson 18 years ago to start doing this work was like coming to a playground for me. Mm. And I was coming from the West where I did my thesis research in Death Valley National Park and um, 
went on to do professional archaeology in uh, Colorado and other states in the West. I'm actually from the Hudson Valley, not about an hour from Patterson. And it was just a big circle getting back, um, getting back home, so to speak. So it's been a real privilege uh, and honor to serve the people of Patterson as a public servant in historic preservation all these years. And I happened to come into this work um, at a magical time when Patterson was planning a state urban park, uh, the Great Falls State Park. And that was followed up right on the heels by the Patterson National Historical Park, the designation that happened in 2009 and the years just before that, uh, the state park under the Governor McGreevy was uh, de designated and announced. So I've had a really, ma a really magical period here in Patterson and um, seen it all. Uh, I'll tell you more about that as, as we go on. All right, great. We just set the, the groundwork for our discussion. So just for everyone who's joined us, um, we have a series of questions which I'm going to pose to the panelists. They'll each give a response. There'll be some, you know, discussion regarding, you know, the topic, you know, of the question. And then towards the end of our session this evening, we'll open it up to Q&A by everyone who's joined us. So uh, with that, um, we know that preservation commissions, you know, uh, face several different challenges from loss of integrity of historic of sites or historic structures over time. There could be applications for demolition that are sort of contested. Uh, sometimes redevelopments can pose a challenge um, or a threat to nearby prop historic properties. Um, and of course, you know, with new technologies and different materials that are, you know, kind of being invented, um, we might have difficulty finding appropriate materials when we're doing the design review process. Um, so we're asking our panelists to please share an example of their latest challenge that their HPC is contending with. Um, Maria, would you like to go first? Um, yeah, th I will. Thank you. You know, here in Westfield, we have one district which we've had since 1984, when we had the ordinance enacted, and uh, and it was the first commission that uh, lived on that street, and uh, uh, and it is a beautiful street of Victorians, but only a block long. Uh, in addition to that, we have currently about 15 individually designated homes, and the reason I bring that up is because I know very much. And five or six of them we've just done in the past four or five years, and we have a few more coming. So we've had a real whirlwind since we've been on the since this new commission has come through with this new administration. And certainly, I don't think I have to tell anyone the importance of an administration that is supportive of preservation in order to get uh, things designated and, and things going. But I think the challenge is that. Uh, uh, we had continually been trying to designate particular districts, and uh, there were always a few, usually in the minority, that uh, homeowners that just did not want to do it. We even have a, uh, a nationally designated district, Stonely Park, um, and every time there was a, uh, a house for sale and a developer came in, uh, the most of the neighbors would be in an uproar, and yet they still didn't want to designate their district locally, which, as you know, gives them the most protection over demolition. So uh, we have just decided to uh, do this one by one, and we have continually done uh, a lot of workshops and education and outreach, and little by little, homeowners are coming to us and, and we're going to them and asking them again, would they be interested in designating? And we're doing it, and um, we've just got five, uh, or the or the, uh, for the fourth one, and another one is coming in Stonely Park that has thirteen homes, and um, and we hope that the uh, that that will continue. So I think that's just a, a real challenge in terms of, you know, changing the narrative of what we feel first for the homeowner of because so many people are still don't understand preservation and they're they're afraid of it, and then secondly changing the narrative on our end and saying, you know, we can do this little by little and it's still significant. So that's, I guess, what I've seen so far. I'll let, I'll let other people uh, add to that. Thank you. 
Maya? Paula, yeah. Yes, Anna, thank you. Um, our historic commission was also formed in the 1980s, and we have three districts, two on the National Register. One was very early 1974, some of the oldest homes in Burlington. In fact, I took, I've been taking courses at Rutgers um, with architects and archaeologists and people who are far more skilled than I am. And I, I trumped a professor who's at the State Historic Preservation Office by saying that's the Ravel House. It's one of the oldest homes in New Jersey from the 1670s. So we have that. We have these historic buildings. Our um, colonial library that George the Third, the George the Third, um, granted. So we had that first in the 70s. By the early 90s, we had our, our main streets called High Street. 105 commercial buildings, some were residential of the most historic buildings. And then I live in the municipal district, uh, which is also along the Delaware River, but on the other side of our of our high street. Now, what does that mean? The two districts in the National Historic Register, they have one set of regulations, slightly lesser regulations where I live. There's always the controversy with money versus what would be historically appropriate. We have a big mix of houses in Burlington from Greek revival to Gothic revival to the home um, General Grant's family lived in during the Civil War, on and on. People do not know even what their home is. I mean, they come in and they want to do something saying it's Victorian, but they don't know the the um, great building that they do have, and we educate them because that's our probably our biggest job is to educate the people in the districts. Windows are always a challenge. Wood windows terribly expensive. We have a fabulous architectural consultant, consultant a man named John Hatch, who's with the law, architectural firm of Clark Caton. He's done many buildings in the state, and he works with us in saying, all right, maybe for this house, it's not a key property, it's not contributing, we would permit composite windows because you don't always get a lot of guidance um, from the national standards. We go into the more complex, which is demolition. Well, there's demolition by neglect. We've had that happen very recently. I'll be cautious about what I say, where the property only let it fall down. And then what an emergency application to demolish. Um, we did not weigh in on that because it was too late and best to not weigh in when the die was cast, so to speak. That is a really complicated issue with homeowners who do not alert us soon enough, do not make a plan and let the place collapse. Well, we had another collapse just a block away from me some years back to historic homes. One collapsed. The city said the other was unsafe, the other was taken down. We have developers who've come in, I'll be limited in what I say, because it's a pending application with drawings. As our architectural consultant said, you're not trying to replicate what was there. It was in 1890 um, Twin Homes. You're not trying to do that, but you're trying to be harmonious within the streetscape. We have 12 standards in our ordinance from height to density to setback. And those are the issues we discussed at some length. It was a long application with the applicant. He'll come back next month with a revised drawing. Materials, any kind of materials are always complicated discussions. That's my overview. Thank you, Alma. John Franco? Yes, thank you, Kelly. So the city of Patterson's historic preservation legacy goes back quite a ways, beginning with the construction of route in, Interstate Route 80, connecting the two coasts of our country, coming through Patterson, headed toward uh, New York back in 1967. And in that time, a master's student from Columbia University's uh, premier historic preservation program came out to visit with uh, the mayor and his wife and informed them about the National Historic Preservation Act that had been passed just a couple years before and said, you know, this highway, this federal project that's going on right through the south part of your city, bisecting through your whole city, um, is threatening a very important uh, set of resources. And we know that DOT is 
trying to buy those resources for some off ramps and create a loop road around Patterson. So this is right at the point of urban renewal as we all know it, so to speak. So that really kicked off the preservation um, education and effort. And it was actually the mayor's wife at the time, Mary Ellen Kramer, who really got motivated to look more into this and started reaching out to all the right powers that be, so to speak, and was able to get a study done of the district that was designated in 1970 as the uh, Society for the Useful Manufacturers Historic District. Uh, so it was entered onto the register at that time. And this is the very seed place where the Great Falls in Patterson is, and the very seed of where Patterson started as an experiment in the vision of Alexander Hamilton in 1792 during the first, um, admin first administration of George Washington. So I'm, I'm sure some of you know something about Patterson and it's a very old city and its legacy for preservation uh, that I inherited coming here in 2005 started uh, a generation ago. And even at that time, there was a discussion about um, the significance of this place uh, being so kind of high on the national scene um, that they should have a conversation about it becoming a national park. And lo and behold, during my tenure here, that's the designation that I mentioned earlier. Uh, so we're all very, very proud of that. Uh, in New Jersey land use law, the um, preservation as part of land use became available to municipalities in, I think, 1988. And it was at that very time that we struck our first official ordinance uh, and, and established a preservation commission with very little administrative controls or parameters. Uh, it wasn't until a few, few years later uh, in 1991 that some of the, the first board was really formed and started to do their first designations at that time. Uh, so our, our board today is... Um, Again, a lot of this is, is dictated by land use law. We have seven members appointed by the mayor, two members that are uh, alternates. And um, they're long time serving members. Our members are really dedicated. Um, we're very grateful for their volunteerism and their dedication to this work. So when applicants come before the commission, um, they come to a board that's very seasoned and experienced in all, all versions of preservation. Um, we had, we had uh, administered three rather large uh, historic districts that are on all three registers, national, state, and local. And, you know, kind of typical of the way that the, the, this old city developed from its very industrial core and its first neighborhoods around the mills, around the waterfall for water power, and then expanding outward, a business district developed right nearby and then further and later on, uh, all the residential district the districts sort of farther away from city center. So mm -hmm. consequently, we have these kind of very convenient uh, historic districts. One at the Great Falls that is really focused on the early history and, and the mills that remain. Um, people might know that Patterson later became known as Silk City for its massive silk production and silk industry. Alt Patterson was also the seat of just many, many um, technical heavy industries as well. And later also pioneered in the early aeronautical industry in the uh, early 20th century, and also pioneered in locomotive building in Amer American locomotive building uh, early on when steam had first come out in the 1840s. So we were participating in building some of the first steam locomotives in America. So we have this you know, wonderful set of districts that are compartmentalized and their architecture sort of, it's very easy to sort of justify those boundaries. We have a wonderful downtown commercial historic district, um, largely characterized by turn of the century Beaux-Arts buildings because of the massive fire that happened in 1902. And immediately thereafter, at sort of at the height of Patterson's wealth and international prowess, they were rebuilding after the fire and they built these massive, uh, wonderful edifices bank buildings. I'm coming, you know, like my office here is on the fourth floor of a 1903 bank building that was designed by Carrere and Hastings. And um, the city hall right across the street from here uh, was built in 1896. 
burned in the fire, also designed by the same uh, designers, very much like modern buildings at the time uh, in, our, in our downtown. Further out on the, uh, in the outskirts of town, we have a very large fully residential district that spans uh, from basically the turn of the century or just before the turn of the century all the way to early modern, the 1950s. So we have a wonderful set of uh, residential buildings to take care of as well. They're eclectic. They're examples of the various uh, episodes of American architecture. And so we have a chance to really do everything. I always joke with people and say, working in Patterson Preservation for our commissioners and for myself and uh, uh, my other staff member, Francesca, um, we get a chance to triage everything. It's like being a doctor in an emergency room. We sometimes don't know what's going to happen next. And I can't imagine that there's a situation that we haven't seen. In fact, in, in the space of one year, we see a whole variety of things. So we get to preside over the birth of new buildings and the death of old buildings and also everything in between. Uh, so that's some context for our preservation program. We've obviously have the, uh, I think the privilege of having uh, the investment in these full-time positions, one of which I'm privileged to hold and the assistance uh, that, that I have, um, position I have, historic preservation specialist positions. And so we can really get through applications. We have the ability to um, we have delegated authority from our commission to be able to review applications that are meeting the standards so that the, the meetings aren't clogged with every single application that comes through. So we work at sort of like this executive level to create staff reports when, when things go to the uh, uh, board or to work directly one-on-one -on -one with clients to in encourage their projects to come closer to the standards. So we're able to say, look, if you work with us here at the staff level, you don't need to go to a public meeting. Um, but looking over your project, these are the flaws we see in terms of meeting the standards. And I, I get to be the judge of that. And uh, they get to work with us and follow our um, conditions if they want to get approved without going to a public meeting. So we're able to keep our meetings very light in that way. Um, and that's really important for such a large city. So that's some context about our preservation. Um, administration we have about it's about 1500 buildings under our purview and patterson is very dense patterson is like among the most densely populated places in america 15 miles away from new york city and we have a very diverse population as well we have 170,000 people living in 8.2 square miles of this very old city so one mayor said at one point, you can't even turn over a stone in Patterson without it being finding a historic nail underneath it. So everything in Patterson has got to be reviewed uh, before it gets touched. I mean, he was exaggerating because I've actually done the math and as many buildings as I just mentioned, it's our designated buildings under our purview is only about less than 2% of all the buildings in Patterson. So would you like me to say something about challenges now or should I wait? Well, uh, yeah, I was just going to kind of circle back, like, you know, just the example that Maria brought forward that one of her challenges was, you know, landmarking. And instead of, you know, landmarking a district as a whole, they're going through the process of right individually listing buildings. Um, so I don't know if you want to add more to that um, or if there's another challenge. And then I'd kick it back to Alma and John Franco to give an example of another challenge that your HPC is currently facing. Okay, I'll take that one, Kelly. Oh. So as an, as an example of landmarking, I, um, I was able to inherit um, th the three districts I described, they were, they were all placed on the National Register by my predecessor. Uh, to, one had freshly been put on the, uh, the lo local designation which was the downtown district and local designation for the Great Falls had happened way uh, before I, I arrived. However, um, the commissioners, as soon as I arrived, um, were charged up about getting the residential district um, locally designated. And you all probably know that a local designation for um, a residential di uh, district is very, very difficult, just like Maria's example pointed out. And getting, for example, in our district, we have about 500 buildings, 500 
individual constituents that would, you know, have to agree or not make a lot of ruckus in the public process for the designation to go forward and get passed at the city council level. So I, I, I'm totally serious about this. It took 10 years of my time here to get the local designation passed for our residential district. Uh, we, we couldn't do it one at a time of the way Maria just described because we have so many buildings and it's such a so much bigger place. But um, similar to Maria's challenge, the same um, aspects uh, apply, which is education, um, being able to be personal and authentic with people about uh, what the designation means and what it doesn't mean, uh, and transparent about um, your 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 uh, commitment to uh, uh, to consistency with respect to playing out um, applications and adjudicating applications on an equal basis. So that was really, really important. So the challenges was just the same here. Um, and this, I think the same um, responses were, were warranted as Maria's example. Yeah, and I'll add to that, that, um, you know, one of the ways that we're also trying to uh, work with residents and or uh, individual developers is through in the informal review process. So um, because our current administration is so pro-preservation, we did update our ordinance two years ago, and mm -hmm. any home pre-1930 has to come to us before demolition. And, um, and certainly then it goes through the process if we can find it you know, historically significant or not. But what that has done is put a bit of a, the brakes on developers just coming in, demolishing, you know, without a second's notice, uh, in addition to clearing all the trees and everything, and just putting up a McMansion, which was, had been happening just unbelievably. I, I, we had some numbers when we redid the ordinance because we were, sadly, it became political and we were uh, met with a, a lot of defiance. But, um, but now that the dust has settled, I will tell you that developers will come to us even before they apply for any sort of demolition process and see the beauty of renovation or um, restoration through the informal process. Sometimes it's resulted in, uh, in a local uh, designation and sometimes it hasn't, but the bottom line is it saves the home. And I had one developer that we were working with, you know, and he said, uh, first, he said, I didn't realize you guys would be so nice and he said, <laughs> never having met us, but, but it just speaks to the, uh, you know, to the stereotype of the HPCs and what we encounter. But um, also when I met with him with our historic architect who sits on the commission uh, and it was an old um, 1920s arts and crafts house and it had these big columns. It was actually stucco. And he said, I can't get those columns anywhere. I, well how, well, how do you want me to, to, you know, to do it? And the architect said, I, I understand they're not standard, but you can certainly recreate them. And it's as if it never entered the developer's mind because they're always about the bottom line and doing things cheapest and stand, you know, standard to make the most money. So it was as if a light bulb went off because certainly by recreating these wider, you know, stucco columns, it made the house more valuable and and he had no problem uh, selling the house once he was done um, to a couple that was moving in from New York. And the, and the other thing that we are seeing um, is that so many people say only old people want old houses, young people don't want, you know, young people want the open concept, even though we tell them they can do anything they want on the inside. Um, but this was a young couple with young uh, children and, you know, and he put in a wine cellar in the bottom and, and we've been seeing a lot more of that couples that live in Brooklyn and Hoboken and Jersey City that actually appreciate this old architecture and, and these old brownstones are actually now looking for uh, homes with character in the suburbs. So I'm finding it exciting. It's just a it's just a continual continuous message that we must put out there because you still have people, particularly many realtors that say, no, no, they don't want these. You know, there is a market for it. I'll just say a sentence about process, Kelly, before you go on with your questions. We don't have the informal process. <clears throat> and we don't probably do not have the number of applications that either of you may have. 
our, our, the process here is you apply, we have to have a full certificate, a complete, complete application in order to grant them a certificate of appropriateness before they can do anything. Whether they do that is a separate issue. Our architectural consultant comes out, photographs the building, does a detailed memo. I would say this is where my training as an attorney comes in because I'm all I'm a believer and make the record. What does that mean? Okay, Mr. Hatch, I believe you said this was a Greek revival home built in XYZ. The columns, could you speak to us about why the columns should be preserved? And then applicant, Mr. Applicant, did you think you might wish to consider uh, maintaining those columns? Well, maybe I will now that you mention it, or maybe I will not paint it purple, I'll paint it antique white. I think people are open when you bring them along somewhat gently uh, in terms of educating them, but I am thorough in making the record of what we're doing and why we're doing it based on the questioning of the applicant. And of course, Mr. Hatcher, our consultants, detailed memos um, because people come in perhaps with not the most um, comprehensive ideas of what should be done to restore any aspect of a historic building. Thank you. And actually, I'm going to, Alma, I'm going to kick my next question for the, our panelists here to you first. Um, but it's important, and we're kind of like segueing into that about like HPC ordinances. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad that, you know, I have three different HPCs represented tonight because I'm sure they're all set up rather differently from administration with, you know, permanent staff, maybe consulting staff, or maybe it's just in, um, the commission itself with no staff at all. Um, several organizations throughout the state, it's not just Historic Preservation Commission, some municipalities have historic preserve or historic preservation committees, or even historic societies, which all play a different role, not necessarily having authority over uh, building permits. So, um, you know, with building review and ordinance, since they do vary, can you provide sort of context for everyone here on what authority is given to your HBC, how you're part of the building permit review process, um, and then just kind of, you know, share if you have or have developed HBC guidelines, um, are they enforced or not enforced, and, you know, you can use examples. Um, I'll go first. First of all, in terms of guidelines, we do have guidelines. I think they're out of date. We've looked at other models in the state. I suspect I should look at what both Westfield and uh, Patterson may have done. I've looked at Hoboken and talked to a member of their commission. Um, I think that there is a great need for design guidelines that are readily available online with examples of all the elements of a historic house so they understand that. Um, in terms of working with the building permitting office, we have a close relationship with them. They've been educated to not go out and grant permits um, and until at least it's in coordination with us. We do have people who got there first and said, but I have a permit. And then somehow they're informed about the commission. Enforcement is an interesting topic. We do not have any enforcement power. We um, may, as a private citizen, call and say, someone's... Uh, ripping down, or my husband might call if it's down the block, somebody's taking out the historic windows or whatever, they're taking away the shutters. And we have a person designated in our housing department to come out and issue a citation. We have a sliding scale of penalties. That's always an ongoing challenge for people who have gotten a certificate of appropriateness to do one specific thing, but they do something else another legal scenario. And I'm sure you've had every kind of scenario in the book that we have. That is, I'd say enforcement is the hardest issue. Maria? Can we go next? <laughs> um, so I agree with you with enforcement being the hardest issue. And it's interesting, I didn't uh, wrote an article um, about Kate May a couple of years back and they, mentioned that they are, Kate May, which you think, you know, their entire economy rests mm -hmm. on their, um, you know, on their Victorian architecture. And yet they hired, uh, I believe a full-time, um, what do they call it? Like a, uh, you know, basically someone who went around to make sure that 
this an uh, uh, an, infor an officer who made sure right. that the certificates were being applied properly, um, mm -hmm. which surprised yes. me because I would think that every resident and or developer in town would realize that that should be the case there. Um, in terms of our ordinance, it's funny because when you talked about painting the columns purple, when we redid our our ordinance two years ago, um, we did make it stronger and and gave us more power in terms of every any. Uh, demolition coming before us uh, pre-1930 uh, had to come before us, but we also took out paint color because oh. for the perception of wanting to be less onerous, we thought we don't care. I mean, we do care and thankfully I haven't seen any purple columns in Westfield, but the truth is just by the fact of taking it out, we felt that that sort of helps go along with this feeling that you know we're not we're we're not going to oversee every single thing you do if that's what you you know if you want to paint your house non historic colors that's okay just designate it and um and again there is someone that's been on the commission for over uh, a decade and she said if i hear from one more person you're not going to tell me what color i need to paint my house I, you know I, i'll just take it out so so we talked about that a lot um we also added uh, an expedited review aspect so that uh, people who were uh, updating, particularly in the district, and we talked to um, many of the residents in the original district from 1984, and they were very frustrated because every time they wanted to do the right thing, like uh, change, you know, uh, repair their stairs or, or change out a window from one wood window to another wood window, they had to pay an application fee and wait for us to tell them it was okay to do so, you know. So uh, I appoint uh, our expedited review officer each year and it is um, the commission member who's been there the longest and she's just fantastic. And she goes and she visits the house. They tell her the materials. She's like, she'll give them the okay. It goes to the um, zoning department and she writes a letter and then she simply reports on it in each meeting. So we're very focused on that whole uh, you know, working with builders and residents and homeowners as much as we can to alleviate any hardships or what they perceive as hardship, you know, uh, moving forward. Yes, yeah, so Maria, that sounds very similar to our process of being able to move uh, applications through that I mentioned earlier about having um, the executive authority to decide on applications and if they meet the standards, um, I can approve them administratively. Um, I think it's actually wonderful that there's not a historic preservation officer um, sitting as like an administrator uh, uh, here in, in the city government to review all the applications such as, like there's a zoning officer that does that. And, and even the zoning officer when um, no, notes that uh, the proposal um, really needs to go to a planning board review or to a zoning board review, then he, he can't really exercise or pass through that. It's got to go to a public review. It's sort of the same, I act in sort of the same way here to help expedite. Um, an informal review is a, a very big part of uh, the process here in Patterson as well. Mm -hmm. um, our ordinance, I mean, I, I came to my work and there was an ordinance and I, uh, it was passed in 1990, 99, early 1990. It was one of, it was the first iteration of the ordinance that Patterson had. And you got to remember, I'd come in 2004. So they had been using this ordinance for quite some time and it had a lot of flaws and it was not more than probably seven or eight pages uh, had no definitions and it was really too small for the amount of work and the uh, breadth of the work that we do here so um, it was very important uh, during my tenure to uh, apply for grants uh, to do local design guidelines so that all the districts have updated design guidelines and also to put in the research uh, with the commission and with the community with respect to updating the ordinance so um, we went through a process of um, seeking out national examples, dialoguing with the State Historic Preservation Office. Um, we are a certified local government member, 
So we have, a, there's a CLG coordinator that is there for that reason. We can dialogue with them about, um, um, and, and they're keeping track of, they're sort of writing out onto the list serve. They say, if everyone would like to please share their ordinance, we'd like to make a database of them. And now we're looking at each other's ordinances and we are looking through local ordinances. The one that um, we became really fond of was Newark's ordinance. And that would be appropriate oh. for us because of the size of our, of our program. So with that in mind, um, we were able to adopt a lot of um, what was in Newark's ordinance by combing through it and changing it according to our tastes and um, what, you know, what we thought might be tweaking it that, that would, might work better here. And we passed a, an ordinance that's probably more than 40 pages now uh, in 2014. And we did that as part of uh, the city's master planning process. And we got right in the middle of uh, getting our ordinance, our master plan, which has a preservation uh, element. Um, it was at the same time, you know, that the national park was also uh, just starting out and we were in planning phases. So one of the agreements that Patterson struck with the National Park Service was to update its ordinance, its, its preservation program and its ordinance and to strengthen it. So we had this opportunity to do that. And um, I think in terms of other uh, uh, municipalities, opportunity can come in, in different um, uh, aspects uh, for when is a good time, a ripe time to uh, change your ordinance. Sometimes it's not the right time to do it right after there's been a real ac um, acrimonious um, uh, challenge in town and, and there's been the preservationists have just suffered a loss under a developer development pressure of or development by neglect that may not be the best time to start changing an ordinance. But um, when you when you change an administration that has um, a very optimistic out, outlook about um, uh, what quality of life preservation brings to the community, that's the time to really make friends and to um, get to know who the administration knows, who voted for that mayor, and most likely support for the program. That's the right time to move it along. Um, so our program, we have definitions in our ordinance. We have sort of a case by case set of standards that are codified so meaning um the the various um, aspects of preservation so if you're doing um um restoration versus rehabilitation versus demolition versus relocation of a building we have a paragraph or a page of each of those aspects within the ordinance that kind of guides the applicant and the commission as to what the commission will be asking and looking for as the standards for review. And then local guidelines are promulgated. We've also adopted the national guidelines. So the Secretary of Interior standards are on the table all the time. Uh, so we have all of it going on. And um, it's, I, I think over the years, um, I love to talk to uh, our, our constituents about uh, preservation from the policy point of view, because I think it's wonderful how we carry out uh, nationally significant levels of preservation in our communities, and also the community empowers itself by passing laws to be able to do its own own municipal designations. It gets to decide on standards for review uh, locally as well. So we can uh, take from the fruit of the tree uh, from the national level, or we can start planning our own here at the local level. Um, I think that's a wonderful way of doing sort of the national patrimony. Uh, across the nation. It's going on in all communities, big and small. And it's really great to be a part of it and tell our constituents that our national stories are valued uh, by everyone uh, by by kind of following this, this program and um, making our policies be more in line with the national uh, standards and programs. And we can get grant money to do that um, if we can line up our resources and our standards and our ordinances to accommodate those um, methodologies. So um, I think that that's really been helpful in terms of how we uh, execute preservation here. But uh, all the relevant information that both Alma and Maria shared about uh, constituency, building um, trust, authenticity, and being uh, friendly and available is important. And uh, one, one other point I remember I'd like to make is the choice about not reviewing paint color in Patterson, we've done it, uh, something similar, um, but what we've done is 
we've always avoided uh, charging any review fees. There's no historic preservation fee for the review. We don't have a fee. Our, our constituents are told, oh yeah, you know, you're not going to get a zoning permit and or a building permit. You know, there's a hierarchy, right? If the, we, we, we train our clerks here that when they meet with applicants who come in and say, I want to make a change to my building, say, what's the address? They look it up. It's in a historic district. It goes to historic. And the zoning officer sends it to historic. It doesn't get scheduled for a planning board review until there is a historic preservation planning review. It doesn't get a building permit until planning signs off on it. So there's definitely um, a very rigid sort of a way that we keep wraps on making sure everyone kind of steps through the process so it's fair for everyone. And the only way we can really be successful is if we get everyone in the district to come to be reviewed uh, when they make changes. So they come in and then we meet with them and um, they're not paying fees for these permits, but they're paying fees for the other permits. And we do the same thing. We do it as um, uh, as we, we we do it as quickly as we can. We we render our decisions administratively as mo as much as we can, so they can move on and pay permit fees to change whatever the changes are uh, to get their building permits. Ultimately, they have to pay a fee for that. So we kind of like that's one way of softening the blow of the extra, because it really is an extra level of review that these uh, constituents have to go through for the public interest of doing preservation in our towns. Thank you. Now we are crunching on time and I do wanna leave it for Q&A. So I'm gonna ask one more question uh, for our panelists and that is to share um, a success story on whether it's a specific project or an HBC uh, initiative. Uh, Alma, do you wanna share first? Yeah, I'll share because this is extremely recent. I um, came to the, when I came on the commission, of course, then a year later, it was COVID. I suggested, even though we were coming towards the end of the urgent period of COVID, that we should relaunch our certificate of appreciation program. When I was here and, and had the first phase of my house done, I got a, a, a lovely little certificate from the Historic Preservation Commission. It meant the world to me. This might have been around, oh, I don't know, 1988 or 89. So we relaunched the program via Zoom with the first set of homeowners, buildings, institutions. We have some uh, historic public buildings in our town. And we did the same just a month ago, this time in person. Our mayor was there, who's a huge supporter. We gave everyone a copy of the Burlington Biographies book. We gave them a lovely certificate. And it was a diversity, six awardees from a young couple. There's nothing like the young couples coming in who have restored their huge side porch and columns on their 1830s house to a project supported by the Daughters of the American Revolution who came into our town and wanted to recognize a home that was one of the original patriots who fought during the Revolutionary War with General Washington, a black man, Oliver Cromwell. It was one of the most moving things. We closed our block we had the ceremony, we had a big dedication about the house and descendants of Mr. Cromwell came. And to them, they said, we heard this history, we live this history, this is our family, but now you, the city of Burlington rep uh, recognize it, as well as the DAR. This was an interesting whole development to the oldest houses, to our historic library that worked very carefully to put in a handicap accessible um, accommodation that fit into the historic building. So we, we do this to be diverse, but to cheer people on and to get publicity. The mayor's written about it in our local paper. So that's a big success. We, we view that as making all of us feel good about the work. And I want to say a, work, a word about color. Uh, we don't say the colors, but we have had people come in and Again, they might say uh, stark white, they want to paint it stark because that's what they know. And Mr. Hatch or I, most likely me, would say, well, would you consider whatever I think the palette might be, not even a specific kind of color, um, an antique, uh, an ivory. And, they, and they're so receptive then, we tell them if you will approve this, go back with Mr. Hatch, our consultant, and he'll help you hone it in to some view colors that might be more appropriate. 
So that seems to work well. Great. Do you want me to go next? Yeah, no, and I agree with the color. I think that, you know, our bigger concern was people use that as an excuse not to designate. However, once they start working with us, it, it they they admit, oh, it turned out better with the, your guidance, but yeah. it, it's, it, you know, it breaks that barrier. Um, my quick success story I'll tell you is that um, when we revised the ordinance in uh Two, two, three years ago, it was a very politically uh, uh, atmosphere. It was a political atmosphere, and and uh, there was a lot of pushback. And there were door knockers and signs. Um, uh, there were signs on a lot of lawns, "Hands off our home," and there were door knockers on anyone who owned a home pre nineteen thirty, basically fear mongering, saying, "We're coming from your homes. We're going to designate." And so uh, it was during COVID and myself and my vice chair um, conducted a lot of Zooms where we tried to, where we did educate and explain what the ordinance was doing and that we weren't coming for anyone's homes and the various standards that are needed to even historically designate a home. But uh, I had felt rather beat up. There were, you know, letters to the editors and articles and um, and I got a call at one afternoon from town hall and they said, oh, someone else called that she lives in an old Victorian and she wants to talk to you. Can you call her back? You know, and I braced myself as, as I knew the woman was about to pick up the phone. And I said, yes, this is Maria Boyce on the chair. How can I help you? And she said, oh, I'm so glad you called. I've been trying forever. I want, I said, at first she said, I got one of those door hangers on my door and I've been yes. wanting to designate my home. And where, where can I go to designate it? And it was just, I just felt hallelujah, you know, all of this opposition and this anger. Actually, this woman who was quite older, she's not on email, she doesn't have a cell phone, she had canceled the local paper. So this mm. was her only sort of um, communication that oh, the HPC is doing something. Let me mm -hmm. call them up. And she had tried with the last administration 15 or 20 years ago to designate her home and the call went unanswered. No one ever called her back. No one cared. So she was just so thrilled and she happens to live around the corner for me and we've become friendly. And I just thought maybe it was all worth it. So that's a success story, I feel. I love that story. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, the, yeah, Patterson uh, has <laughs> so many wonderful success stories. Um, I'm, I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna like to do do one, another, a recent one also that is similar to the ones we just heard. And it has to do with, um, uh, you know, people adopting a, a historic home, and some of the other comments that Maria made earlier um, about stereotyping and it, it sort of. It brings us to mind as well. So we had um, in our residential district called the Eastside Park Historic District, we had this wonderful Dutch colonial that had so many authentic exterior features that was owned by a very prominent uh, Patterson political family. <clears throat> and everyone knew the, the gentleman and his um, son who still lived in the building and he was very old and he passed away and the building was really up in limbo. So after he passed away, it must have been several years that the building sat vacant and started to get really like out of control. Uh, the commissioners knew the building very well. We had all attended Christmas parties there. Um, the, the man was an amazing character in the community. Uh, he was a Pattersonian through and through with respect to, I mean, I mean this, this man's great, Great grandfather was the mayor of Patterson during the Civil War. You know, this is like mm -hmm. the kind of legacy that this family had. So, um, this kind of care, this eye on this building, like this sense of dread, because we we didn't know who was going to buy the building. Um, we all know that preservation is not coming for people's buildings; it's passive. Uh, people have take their own time to decide when when, and where and how they wanna change their buildings and what their budgets are. Um, and it's at that time when they come to get their permits, which they have an obligation to do under zoning law that we get triggered to get involved. So in the meantime, if you're looking at a building that's like 
starting to fall down or there's issues or that everyone cares about and the, the, uh, the careful owner dies, it's really a period of limbo. So we were really frightened about what was gonna happen with this building. So I, I finally got a call about the building from, um, uh, I, ha I actually happened to be on vacation as well at the time. So I remember being in the hotel room in between uh, traveling, like writing back, uh, you know, he's, we're doing this informal back and forth on, you know, what, what the designation means. And I really wanna buy this house and there's a slate roof and I need to replace it. Would I be able to use asphalt shingle? Like I, I was trying to make all of these decisions and, and coach him along and, and, and tell him like, I, I, I can't tell you that I have all the authority in this. I can only guide you along. And we are, there is also a language barrier, it happened to be Dominican and, he, and he, his first language was Spanish. So it wasn't easy to do all this like while I was traveling with the language barrier and trying to do it by email, you know, more so than on the phone. So ultimately this last year, we also have a wonderful longstanding um, preservation awards dinner uh, where we honor uh, on an annual basis um, uh, the great projects we gave uh, an award to his family for this building um, that they restored. It, and so what happened in between my discussion with him and the award was like pretty much a labor of love. Uh, you know, we asked him, why did you buy this house? He said, my wife and I and our kids were looking for a home and she fell in love with this one. And it was just trashed. I mean, water was coming in. There was mold everywhere inside the building. It was just like, okay, the money pit, we're going to do it. And he told everyone at the awards dinner that he had never done some of this work before. And, he pre and we presented photos of him and his brother and his family members, like uh, putting the elbow grease in and learning and buying the materials and getting it done. They did such an amazing job. Uh, they followed the guidelines and we have a lovely restored home that's um, in a new family, new young family in that building. And you know, it's, it's given a whole new life um, as, as a home for, for a family. So that's a great success. And again, there's so many in Patterson, but that's the one I'd like to share with you tonight. I think going back to the stereotypes, I'm thinking about it the other way around, Maria, where um, it would have been easy to say, well, what do they know about preservation? You know, he's, he's not from Patterson. He doesn't know the architecture of the community. Um, in fact, um, you know, their, their family is Dominican and will they appreciate this? Like, will they be able to adopt this new community and all of this, you know, history baggage that comes with it, this historic baggage that comes with it. And this is an example of like, sort of not to judge the book by its cover. And that's a very big, part of oh, how we have to do our work in Patterson because it's such a diverse community. And the challenge always is to be able to, as Alma said earlier, is to be able to break this barrier of uh, being able to pass forward the wonderful stories and the proud history of our communities to a new generation and to new, uh, new, new building owners. Well, thank you guys so very much for, uh, you know, answering all of our questions and sharing your stories with everyone on here. So I'm going to open it up. Um, if there's any questions by anyone in the audience, you can use the chat feature or you can unmute yourself and ask away if you have a specific question that you want one of our panelists to answer. Anyone wants all the trumpet at once? <laughs> We have a shy group, but I would like to share that did come through the chat feature. Um, Isaac had mentioned or, you know, acknowledging all accomplishments is a mantra of his and the certificate of appropriateness should lead to a certificate of appreciation for work done well. And I know Agree. we Yes, that uh, we have an yeah. annual preservation awards dinner. Um, Maria and Alma, is there, did, does your commissions, um, you know, do certificates or a program similar, or how do you, how do your commissions show appreciation for the work that's being done uh, in your community? Well, well, that's what I was saying. We just yeah. did that last month in May at our meeting to six awardees from the young couple to the, um, the Oliver Cromwell House down the down to other buildings. So we we weren't as fancy as a dinner. We're a small town. 
but we did have a lovely ceremony at our, you know, where the city council meets. The mayor was there. Some council people were there. We were able to have lovely photograph, publicize it, put it in the local paper. And I think people like to be thanked. You know, people like to be thanked for the work they've done. And similarly, we have uh, the Devlin Awards named after Harry Devlin, a local artist. And we give awards to, uh, you know, uh, designated or not, primarily non-designated uh, homeowners that have uh, undertaken renovation, renovations or restorations that, um, that we feel are, uh, you know, appropriate, uh, historically appropriate to the, to the home that they live in. Wonderful. Do we have any other questions for our panelists? Um, I wouldn't mind asking, sort of telling a story and asking a question at the same time. Um, my name is Trevor LeProvost. I'm president of the Historical Society of West Windsor. We're just, just near Princeton, right next to Princeton. And our land use officer just presented to planning board a historic preservation element to the master plan. We do not have one. Mm -hmm. uh, when he told me that, so I said, oh, great. Then we can have a commission. Well, he says, I don't want to form a commission. I just want to put the element in the master plan. I'm like, so you have this element in the master plan. How does it do anything or how does it get enforced? He says, it doesn't. It's just a, so what it came down to is when i was at the planning board meeting is basically they put it to the planning board and said that the historical society would like to see a commission formed and basically the commission said the planning board said well you have to talk to the mayor and convince the council to do this so right now um, i'm a historical society leader but i'm not an hpc expert by any means well, so you know my question is how would you start i mean most of you have communities that have had this in place for decades i'm starting this off from scratch i think you have one great <laughs> argument for lobbying and i started my career a long time ago as as the director of a legislative commission so i know a little bit about lobbying the argument you make is the value of historic preservation economically it increases the value of homes it increases the value of businesses who are in even if it's a locally designated district and not a national historic district so right. i think the, the the you know the argument to the council because you need somebody to put an ordinance in to be considered and the mayor to support it is this doesn't take away, it adds to the luster of our community by right. recognizing those buildings in the district that deserve the greatest attention and assistance. It's always about the positive, not that we're over-regulating you, but we're giving you that support for your buildings that you may not have at this point because, you know, homeowners or, or commercial buildings or institutions, if they don't know where to go, you know, they're just lost, but we can offer this as a resource. And the other thing I want to say is there, you know, we come, all of us with ordinances, there is state law behind this. I know yes, Kelly, yes. Must, as the expert, must know that best of all. So, you know, we're not creating something new. We have a significant number of communities that already have longstanding historic preservation commissions. You have a lot of models to look at. And actually, it's... Uh, it, it's imperative that like a local ordinance has to be um, driven by uh, state law. You, you, the local ordinance can't contradict state law. So the state law can be for preservation. We, we find, you know, we, there's always times we have to find out what the state law says. And we find right. that sometimes it's very specific and sometimes it's not. Right. So uh, using local models is a great way of doing that. Um, we can get, we can, give you the contact at the State Historic Preservation Office mm -hmm. that I mentioned, who's the okay. CLG coordinator, and they've been collecting ordinances. I'm sure they'd be happy to share a whole bunch of them with you. And then you're gonna need help. You're gonna need people who know how to read ordinances, uh, people who know about planning uh, to be able to sift through them and filter through them. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if that's gonna be a volunteer, an attorney, like 
everyone probably knows that not all attorneys are the same when it comes to what they what they do. So you'll need an attorney who knows this kind of law to be able to help guide you. The local planning board uh, meeting with the planning director, uh, meeting with the plan director several times. Uh, in fact, he's your public servant and he should be willing to meet with you and encourage you to uh, share his expertise uh, with respect to looking at some of those ordinances and helping guide and, and explaining them to you. Okay. The only other thing I would add is that there's power in numbers. When you address the planning board, when you address the town council, yes. do it with everyone who's in your society, any mm -hmm. residents right. that are interested, maybe start a petition. Yeah. You know, you need sure. it, it, uh, many voices are listened to much more readily than just one. And business owners, yes. you need yeah. some business owners. And, and homeowners that are in the they, historic areas. You should try there, to also flesh out where you're thinking, what the geographic right. area would be. Right. Yeah. But are, even people who aren't don't live in the historic areas. I mean, there yeah. are everybody. This historic preservation benefits everyone in the town, right? I mean, I think the out the as you mentioned, Alman. Uh, you know, it's always surprising to people when you talk about higher um, property values. You know, people think just the opposite. But Correct. neighbors who don't right, live that, in that. historic homes care about what the property next door to them might be or vice, yes. you know, down the street. Yeah. So, you know, as many voices as you can get to help you would be. And helpful. that was a misconception because a lot of the want this because then it'll restrict the use of their home and it will make it less valuable. No, that's not true. Yeah. The preservation does that, not that was their use. Right. 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 And I've and I've read some from the local municipalities. I'm I have Princeton, I have Pikestown Borough. Familiar with that. Yeah, um, I was gonna, I was going to say that actually. You you say you're near Princeton, and Princeton has a preservation commission. You may want to go start talking with them specifically yes. because they're your neighbors. Uh, and Princeton that, has that twenty be, districts. Yeah, yeah. twenty one. Oh, right. <laughs> Last I talked to them, it yeah. was 20. But Princeton has, like most of you sound like you have main streets and commercial. These are small hamlets of maybe 30. It's okay. To, That's 30 it'll to be, 50 it'll homes. Be the, it'll be the same with, stuff. Yeah. With a, with a church and a general store and right. some homes. Right. You know, I mean, these aren't big development. These are yep. small areas within the township. I mean, probably about 90. I'd say if 10% of the township might qualify, that would be generous. So um, they, I think I have to break it down and let them know what areas and it limits, you know, out of, well, the town from the early 1980s had about 7,000 residents and developers came in in the 80s and now we're hitting 30,000. Well, you know, the, um, yeah, right. the the planning, the planning director and, and the mayor and so on could write a grant uh, to have funding to hire Mr. Hatch to come in and do a, do a survey and identify. Oh, yeah. Mr. Families. Hatch would be perfect. Yeah, he's not be down. He's that. near. He, is, he would be. He's our consultant and he's local. Yeah. He's trying. He, he's yeah, right. statewide. He's, okay. Yeah, he, he's so he would great. Be great. We work with him, too. He's great. So yeah. highly recommended. Okay. But in other words, you don't even have to do it on your own. Uh, writing a grant to get a $10,000 grant to do some of this isn't very difficult, but you're gonna right. need the township to put the application. in. Right. Yeah. So Good I, luck with it, Trevor. I, I think I've bitten off more than I could chew. It's something I want, but it's, I'm not a public person. I'm not a public speaker. I've been forced to now that I took over the presidency of the Historical Society. And it's intimidating sitting in front of a bunch of people and firing questions at you like, and you don't know it's, all the an and you don't know all the answers and you feel yourself kind of grasping and, you know, hoping somebody, some, well, luckily some of the, actually some on the planning board actually jumped in arguing and to my defense with other planning board members because they're interested in the history of the town and right. the architect. So it was a start. I talked to the mayor. He said, draft something up and we'll talk about it and we'll start there. So this is probably going to be a long it's we gonna support be a long, you. We salute you. It's, it's, <laughs> yes. it's we salute you. A long process. Mm -hmm. I know this isn't going to get done overnight because they they haven't even accepted the 
Element yeah, well, nothing gets, very little gets done overnight, Trevor. You, most of us just sleep overnight. <laughs> yeah. That's true. And uh, this municipal, the mayor and the council are nice, but the business administrator and some of the others in the inner workings and bowels of the township are, ooh, they're tough. <laughs> The public figures that are elected are nice. The working stiffs, they don't like what you want to do. <laughs> thank you, Trevor. So, thank I think you, um, you. next to you, we have Elizabeth. She has a, her hand raised as well. Elizabeth. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, so I'm the uh, store preservation officer in Princeton. So, Trevor, if you want some <laughs> feedback, oh, I'm happy wonderful. to help you out. And in addition, I see that three of our members of the commissioner on here, Julie Capazzoli, who is the HPC chair, David Shore, who's our vice chair, and Frida Howard, who's a recent but very vital commission member um, hey. as well. And um, oh, as I wonderful. think some of you know, Isaac Kramer, yeah. who was on, who I didn't know was going to attend, he recently was named executive director of the Princeton Business Partnership. So we were very well represented. So <laughs> thank you for great, the panel great. for doing this. So the oh, question I have is, um, we have very similar processes to the ones that the panelists have talked about. We have the um, administrative review. Uh, we have view, which is ordinary maintenance, where they're not really required to do any application or a replacement in kind. They just have to tell us what it is that they're actually doing so we know that it actually is replacement in kind. Uh, the ones that go to the Historic Preservation Commission, as you all know, it goes before the full commission and the application has been deemed complete and um, agenda packages sent out. Um, what we are finding um, problematic are applications or work that's being done in Princeton where um, they like to um, ask for forgiveness before they right. receive approval. And mm -hmm. it's becoming prevalent. And I was wondering if any of you could talk about that, you know, how you've addressed that or how you've worked through that? Yeah, this is a really complicated one that we all share. Um, you know, like in, in uh, ultimately <laughs> preservation or, or maybe, how should I say this? I wanna say preservation is a function of government. It's not, it's a function of the community and government working together. Um, I think that our experience with our local government sometime or government sometime is like we're the constituents and government is doing this to us and like sort of we just have no choice. It's law, right? There's there's laws and you have to follow the laws, right? Uh, you know, but with preservation um, and, and with other law too, like when constituents participate, it's successful. When they don't, it's not successful. So um part of uh, this problem has has to do with that. Like you start to think about the level of participation and support you have in the community. And sometimes that uh, is based on who's coming and who's going. I think that was one of the stresses that uh, or stressors that Alma mentioned in the beginning, that a lot of the old timers in the community or those who are natives in the community feel a lot of threat and ownership of the community and change to the community by new families or new people coming in um, they, they really feel like there's a void in passing on the um, uh, value of the community when it comes to um, its background, its history, and all of its stories. But everyone has to participate in community, and communities have to grow, just like I, old buildings. Old buildings need new uses, otherwise they don't survive. So um, you need to uh, start with constituency. Um, that's something you can, everyone can do at, on, the, at their own, on their own pace. And um, there's a lot of novel ways to do it in, in your community. Second is to work with your, um, your enforcement officers. Preservation boards and commissions don't have enforcement authorities, but I think people in, um, the people in, the, in our cities where they, we have a preservation commission understand that if the, if the guidance of the commission is not enforced, ultimately, our 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 work is is not is not um, uh, going to be successful. So what, yeah. there's got to be right. there's got to be sort of consistent enforcement after the HPC meeting and when the work starts to get uh, going on. Now, when people are not getting permits or they're claiming ignorance of the law, that's not an excuse. Our attorneys here are very well versed 
and going to court, um, uh, or I'm sorry, the prosecutor in the city, going to municipal court and saying to um, one of the constituents, well, you know, we don't argue about what you know or don't know about the ordinance. This is the ordinance and uh, you, you know, you need to follow it. You're here now, uh, maybe you moved, just moved here. Um, but we look more for compliance when we get to that level with people. So the, they're going to court, they're facing the prosecutor, they're telling the judge they didn't know. Um, sometimes it's bona fide true, sometimes it's a big lie. Uh, but either way, they eventually come and talk to us and we uh, gauge with them what sort of the, like where it is they want to be. They want to be paying a fine. And once they pay one fine, they'll pay another fine if they don't come into compliance. Or do they want to come into compliance and have us talk about uh, dropping the, 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 the case or the, uh, the ticket, so to speak? So well, that's the, the right. method that we use here. But it's really important that you get with your uh, enforcement people and you get a game plan with them and uh, you start to interact with them as much as possible to appreciate your program and your work and make them understand how vulnerable your program is if they don't do their part in enforcement. Our, um, our enforcement officer, when he learns that someone started a project in one of the three districts without approval is to issue a stop work order and invite them and strongly uh, encourage them to come in and, and meet with us. We have an excellent secretary to our commission who works with them on the applications, um, gets them in touch with Mr. Hatch. And we encourage when people come in before the commission, I just wanted to say this, to bring samples of their materials. Um, I think that helps us as commissioners make the right determination. Maybe because I'm a lawyer, I look at it, my job, they're bringing me facts whether it's a roof or windows or, or whatever aspect of their building, facts to our ordinance. I always have my ordinance there with all the elements of what a repair, you know, the parameters for a repair. If it's something that's just inclined, we don't get into that. And, but if we get the step work order, people do come in, we're fairly quick. We don't have a huge agenda, three, four, sometimes five applicants and try to resolve it that evening. It's rare that it's carried over and uh, then they get their certificate of appropriateness and they can begin their work without any penalty. So um, what about if the work is already done and then you find out about it? Do yeah, that's a tough you, one. Uh, <laughs> we ask problems. them to come in, that happens. That's it. We ask them to come in and we go through with them some elements may be acceptable, others may not. Exactly. And, and it's a whole dialogue of, would you change this? And sometimes, of course, damage has been done that cannot be undone. That is a significant problem of, um, you know, a port and hysteric element that has been removed and cannot be re replaced. But if it can be taken back to what it was, we work with them to do that. Some, and there's also money. A lot, a lot of money has been spent too by, yep, by these folks. Exactly right. That's, a that's lot very of money painful. Has been, yes. Yeah. Um, but I, but I think um, that that game, that uh, b that back and forth, or that um, sometimes it's like I, it, it's like the old uh, routine that we we all know about called the good cop and the bad cop. Mm -hmm. However, it is you decide you want to do that with a constituent. Um, like you sort of let them know you have the authority to ask them to reverse everything and throw all their money that they spend in the garbage. And the other the other person is going to come in and say, well, you could also just cooperate with us and we'll <laughs> accept some of this. And we can make make it less painful. And then the other right. guy leaves the room. I mean, it can be any number of ways, but it's, it's somewhere in between. Um, there's also the ability to um, you know, violate, as I was mentioned, to uh, uh, the way that we have our violations set up is we give a notice um, and give them time to get in touch with us and to understand what the issue is. And you have to be very articulate and be able to come right down to the point of what was wrong with the work. Uh, so we have them fill out an application as if they're starting from the beginning and they never came to us. They, right. they tell us all the stuff right. they've done in the application. Right. And then we'll issue a letter of denial, for example, for example. We've done and that. We, and then we proceed, that. you know, proceed from where, where I just mentioned. 
A letter of denial without prejudice for the non-lawyers means you can come back to us. You have a second bite at the apple without, you know, without prejudice. That's what I meant to say. With prejudice, right. forget it. But we do it without prejudice. You can come back again, try again. And there are always going to be a few individuals who, no matter what your best efforts are, do not wish to be compliant. And that might be a bigger discussion, Kelly, than tonight. Yeah, yeah I think I think it is. I, I don't want to. I mean, this is a great discussion, and probably for another panel. I was just going to add, and I know John Fung is be very nice, but the Patterson HPC is very—they're <laughs> very tough when it comes to us uh, work that has already been done. And right, those applicants come before the meeting, and you know, we we do tell applicants to take it all down, and you know, kind of bring it back. And yes. It, it's, it's sometimes sad. There's difficult challenges in terms of costs already spent. Sometimes it's not the owner, it's their contractor. And then there's yep. right, a different re relationship with that. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, yes. we are bound by what our right, ordinance and the guidelines that we've prepared and how we review the districts. But oh, and, and by the way, uh, our ordinance uh, states that there's no discrimination between the none. contractor and the owner. Like both of them will be violated. Mm -hmm. They're not going to point mm -hmm. the fingers at each other. That's an interesting in point. Yeah. So, um, is there any other, any other questions before? I just have one more, yeah, sure. if I can. Sure. This was for Alma. Alma, you talked about that you have an architectural consultant that comes out who takes photographs and gives some additional information on a property. Is that something that is because you said that you do not charge an application fee? How right. is that? How is that service paid? Oh, that's a great question. That's a line item appropriation in the mayor's budget. Um, for those who may know Mr. Hatch, he's, I always say, we're paying you a pittance compared to the value of who you are. He has, a, he prepares a written memorandum in some depth about the history of the building and all of the elements, comments and ele all the elements in the proposal uh, with a photograph. And, and there's two, three, four page memos. I mean, they're really in depth on each application. And he's at okay. the meeting and he, you okay. know, so when our applicant comes in, he's sworn, he testifies under oath about what he wishes to do. He has already received a copy of Mr. Hatch's memorandum. So he's well aware. A lot of times there's no issue. You know, they've come in, we concur. It's great and good. We review it because sometimes there's something that they haven't told us that comes up just that night. Um, and you know, but if Mr. Hatch identifies me, then that's where we develop the record with the applicant. And I try to be and others on the commission of bridge with, well, Mr. Hatch, what would you think? Could we, you know, to come up with something that is in accordance with our ordinance, but also reflects where the applicant wants to go. So the architectural, the, con the architectural consultant basically reviews the application and write the report on it? Correct. Okay, it, it, that's what I do. Recommendations. <laughs> yeah, and I he either says it's it all somebody. great. Or, yeah, no, he does a great report. Yeah, I like the fact that uh, I thought it was, a, uh, he would be someone or she would, the person would be someone who would actually go out and take photographs and cement things. They do um, that too. Everything. So that, that would be some supplemental um, information that would be very helpful for us, but I didn't realize he does everything, which is also great. Yeah. But, but Elizabeth, a lot of HPCs are operating just like yours, where the chairperson is largely responsible for going out and doing photos and trying wow. to um, uh, educate the board or prepare the applications. And it's such a benefit to have, especially when you have like, uh, in John's case, he's an architect, right? Um, you can have a historic preservation specialist who's qualified um, and has training in historic preservation who can provide the same services. And that really helps to give weight to the opinion that is written in the memorandum that Alma was talking about. Like I do that here, I'm paid by the city as an employee to do that. So I provide that function here among many other uh, functions that the city has to comply with with respect to the state preservation laws and reviews that when when the, when the city makes changes to its historic buildings. So we kind of apply to the SHPO as the, the state HPC, so to speak. So I'm, I'm doing that on behalf of the city as an applicant as well. 
But on in your case, any municipality can put some money away for if they're going to have an HPC, there, there's got to be some budget yes. for it. And there should also be legal services um, that are We offered. do have a we do yeah. have an HPC attorney. They'll assign you uh, some legal services. It's, right. uh, that's important. Yeah. And he's actually been with the commission, which, you know, Princeton consolidated between borough and township. And he was with the township for probably over 30 years. So the consistency is great to have him Good. there. Excellent. Yeah. So thank you so much. All right. Well, thank you everyone again for coming. This is recorded, so we will share it and it'll be posted online via YouTube and our website. Um, I want to thank the, the panelists for joining us. Thank you Much all. Thank you. thank you all. And we hope that everyone has a wonderful evening and stay tuned for more HBC panels with PNJ. Right. And we wish Trevor much success. Yes, much yes. success. Thank you. Thank you help her, <laughs> go and help him, Elizabeth. <laughs> <laughs> Get a call. Have a good Have a night. Great. Memorial. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank All you, right. Kelly.